Okay, so all introductions done in the previous video. I'm going to start it on chapter one. This is Travels with Nobody uh, by Michael David Vinsel. That's me. And uh, this is Stephen Stroh, Recalls America in the Early 1980s. Okay, chapter one First time across the country. My name is Stephen Stroh. I'm from New Hampshire, 57 years old, been living in Japan with my wife, Fusako, for almost 20 years. Four years ago, a routine checkup had found albumin in her urine. That had been the first sign of trouble for my mother, who had died many years before, after four years of kidney dialysis and then a kidney transplant. She died of pneumonia, a complication from the rejection of the kidney. That happened when I was 20 years old. My mother was 53 when she died. Fusako's case turned out to have been a false alarm. She's at work now. I have Mondays off. I've taken a walk for the afternoon to a pond near our house, where I sometimes come to sit and watch the birds while old men fish with cane poles for carp. I watch the birds and the people, and sometimes I draw or paint pictures. I daydream. I think back to, to things that happened long ago, trying to remember how they happened and what to make of those memories. Other people come in to paint pictures by the pond, mostly retired men. They set up their portable easels and paint en plein air in oils on canvas. Some of them are very skillful painters. Their painting kits age-worn, un, uh, unadorned wooden boxes resemble those of the Impressionists, which I've seen on display at museums here in Japan. As winter becomes spring, photographers gather to photograph the activities of the newly arrived migratory birds nesting in the reeds at the far side of the pond. They set up their tripods and cameras, adjusting massive telephoto lenses, and take pictures often waiting for hours for the next perfect subject to present itself. Okay, here's a picture that goes along with that. So this would be the pond. And this is actually my impression of Horogai Pond, which is just up the street from where we live. Okay, and I want to point out, you might notice that this picture I'm painting is not the scenery there, but that's actually this picture here. So that's me having just in St. Louis, that's the uh, a gateway arch in the distance there. So when I was approaching St. Louis for the first time, I stopped the car and got out just to look at, you know, look at what it looked like. And this is going to be the first time I crossed the Mississippi River. Okay. Okay. The pictures I paint are not of the pond, typically, or the birds or any of the scenery of the pond. They are of scenes I remember from my life. Sometimes people come to see me. Uh, to see me, uh, sometimes people come up to uh, to me to see what I'm painting. They are always polite, dignified, but I can detect their discomfort when they notice that I'm not painting the pond scenery. Just a twitch of the lip, or a monetary furrowing of the brow. What is the point of painting en plein air? if you aren't trying to capture the scene in front of you. I guess what I'm actually doing at the pond is thinking en plein air. My pictures are illustrations of those thoughts. Why don't I do that in the privacy of my own home, where such unconventional behavior would not be noticed? I suppose it is because outside I can let my thoughts off the leash. My memories come to, memories come to me more freely that way. A word association cascade initiated by the shape of a cloud, or olfactory deja vu brought on by the smell of the soil coming to life in the spring. Our house, like many Japanese houses, was not designed to take advantage of the view outside. The windows have frosted glass crisscrossed with wire mesh for security. I suppose that's the reason why I go to the pond. I'm trying to keep all the events in sequence. It's, it is almost March. The cherry trees which line the walkway which rings the pond 
will be will begin blooming in a few weeks cherry blossom time one of the great festive occasions of the world but for now the trees are leafless so some yoshino cherry trees the type planted all over japan bloom before any leaves come out it is a clear cool afternoon an aosagi a gray heron in english silently hunts among the new shoots of reeds along the edge of the pond fishermen lounge on the concrete steps which stretch like bleachers along the water's edge cane poles protruding from under the shade of silver and black uv protective umbrellas that trip that first drive across the usa when i was just 20 years old out of my parents driveway down filbert hill road onto route 101 west the radio faded to static before i even got out of new hampshire the dial was broken i couldn't change the station it was stuck on 92.1 fm wsle peterborough new hampshire fritz weatherby had played ripple by the grateful dead dedicated to me by tracy bass the first girl i might have loved but it hadn't worked out. She had called the radio station and requested the song and told Mr. Weatherby that I was leaving for California that morning and she wanted to dedicate the song to me. Somehow the timing had been perfect. I had been driving for around an hour, maybe more, when the song came on. Tracy had chosen that song for me. It hit me right in the heart. And if you go no one may follow that path is for your steps alone tracy had thought that about me the next song had been this land is your land by woody guthrie i took that to be a tip of the hat from fritz himself okay and here's a picture of driving across the country no specified place there but you might see in the rear rear mirror that's my skis there in the back seat okay okay by the end of that song i was beyond the range of the station i turned off the radio and just drove i was past keen uh, keen on route nine i had no inkling at the time that many year many years later I would enroll in the teacher certification program at Keene State College. My plan for the day was to get close to Buffalo, New York and get a motel. Grandma and Grandpa Phillips lived in East Aurora. I would visit them that night if I arrived early enough. The day was sunny and cold, leafless. Uh, it was cold, leafless maple branches glowing silver against the sky, winter setting in. But I was heading to California. It felt like a good day to drive. The road was familiar. I'd driven Route 9 through Vermont to Bennington and then into New York State just the previous summer with Chuck Lombardi, Pete Malm, Rich Sanderson, and two girls from Boston University on our way to a Grateful Dead concert in Saratoga. After that, one of the girls, Karen Parker, had joined me on a string of dead shows to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, then down to Meriwether Post Pavilion in Maryland. I'm not sure. I think the order is the opposite. I think it was Maryland first and then Harrisburg, but I don't remember. Nothing romantic came of that as much as I wished it might have. She had a boyfriend who hooked up with us at the Maryland shows. That had been the previous summer. Now it was November. Some, year, some years before, I had started reading Moby Dick. I started reading it several times, but never finished it. But I liked the opening where Ishmael walks down into Massachusetts from New Hampshire, a deep, dark November in his soul, I think he says, and that in such a state, men are drawn to the watery parts of the world, or something like that. I suppose that I, too, felt it was a deep, dark November in my soul. But I was not drawn to the water. I was drawn to the country, to the land. It's the land, Scarlet. 
this land, your land, my land, and I was heading out west. Go west, young man. What would I do out west? I really didn't know. I had enough money to get to California, but what about after that? What kind of work would I do? It was Rich Sanderson who got me to start reading Moby Dick. I must have been 16 or 17 years old. We were camping. We had fished in the afternoon and caught several brook trout, had built a fire and were cooking the trout. I, was, I always brought bacon and an onion and salt and pepper for cooking trout whenever we camped. I'd saute the cut up onion in the bacon fat. Then with the onions to the side, I'd saute the trout. I remember Rich, his aluminum mesquit plate with his trout on his lap. He narrated as he seasoned the fish. Indeed, when judiciously salted and judgmentally peppered, they are among the most sublime of foods, he said. I remember asking him how he learned to talk like that. I told him that I admired that ability and would like to be able to talk like that too. He told me that that was from Moby Dick by Herman Melville. There was a copy of it in our house. So I had taken it down and started reading it. I never got even, even to the middle of the story, but Rich was right. That book was full of interesting ways to say things. I had always cultivated my identity in terms of my membership, I mean, uh, in terms of membership in my group of friends. The first real group of uh, friends I had were Tom Larch, Billy Crow, and the other kids who hung around the great tree fort we had all built in the woods beside the Larch's house. I first met Tom in in fourth grade. Other kids joined that crew over the years until we were in high school. By that time, it was a circle of some 20 kids, mostly boys. We had developed a re reliable means of obtaining beer and liquor. I'd tell my parents I was going camping for the weekend and we would all meet up at the fort. That's what we called the tree fort. We'd stay up all night drinking and sometimes smoking weed if anybody had any. Our parents would give us each a dollar a day to buy lunch at school. Before we were 15, before we were allowed to work, we would save our dollars to buy certain things. The first time we did this, we all saved up for four weeks, $20 each, and each of us bought a BB gun. Uh, my parents would not have allowed would not have allowed me to have a BB gun, so I kept it at the fort. Other guys did too. We even fashioned a fairly nice gun rack and mounted it to the uh, in the fort to keep them. Tom's father had woodworking tools in their garage. He allowed us to use the jigsaw to make things out of scraps of wood they had. Tom's parents did not know about the BB guns or the weed or liquor uh, for that matter. The fort was high up in the trees and required considerable skill to climb up. His parents never went up there. We also bought safety goggles. That began our period of BB gun fights. We would divide into teams up to 10 guys on a team. Each team would start out walking toward each other from opposite ends of a trail in the woods. We would creep down the trail, keeping 30 feet or so between us, communicating with hand signals as we had learned from movies. Goggles on, listening for the first sign of the other guys. It got exciting the further in we got because you'd never know if the other guys had detected you first and set an ambush. That's what we'd do if we'd heard them. Uh, it was always the first guy, the guy on point we called it, who'd get hit first. Out of nowhere, just one shot, and the guy would be wincing in real pain. Then the action would start. I got hit many times in those BB gun fights, even in the head, even though we had a rule of no head shots. We didn't trust the, goggle, the goggles completely, even though we had tested them by strapping a pair to a rock and shooting at it. The BBs had bounced off, but still we wanted to be responsible. No headshots was the rule. The woods behind the Larch's house went on for miles. 
We knew all the trails. Most of the guys had daisy lever action guns that were spring powered, uh, which were not powerful enough to penetrate skin unless you were very close. But some of us had Crossman 760 pump models. At 10 pumps, those could easily penetrate fl flesh even at a distance. We had a rule that they could only go up, uh, they could only go up to three pumps. One sunny spring day, we were far out in the woods having an action-packed battle. Both teams were letting each other have it, shooting, pumping, as quick, pumping up as quickly as we could, shooting again. Getting hit with a BB really hurts, but it usually doesn't cause any serious damage, as long as it's not a headshot. It was like getting stung by a bee, or uh, stung by a wasp. But once, Tom's younger brother, Robbie, got hit right in the Adam's apple. This time, the BB went in. He was shouting for us to stop, that he'd been hit. Kids kept shooting. It was normal for people to shout like that, so just as we figured it must, be, must have been like in real war. Then, after a minute or so, the shooting stopped. Everybody was silent in their positions. Robbie called out that he'd been hit. He'd been hit in the neck, and the BB had gone in. He was bleeding. We had to stop. Everybody stood up and walked through the um underbrush to where Robbie was. He had taken off his jacket, and the chest of his T-shirt was soaked in blood. He was standing, no, he was wadding up the shirt and holding it over the wound, smearing blood on his face and belly. He said that the BB had gone in. It was under the skin. Together, we got him up and all walked with Robbie to the house. When we got to the edge of the field behind the house, we could see Mrs. Larch hanging the laundry, uh, hanging the laundry on the clothesline. Tom shouted for her to get the car. Robbie had been hit in the neck. She looked around to see what we were talking about. What she saw was a bunch of kids carrying guns saying her, that her son had been hit. Her son smeared with blood. She dropped what she was holding and stood silent. I saw her hand come to her mouth. Then she dropped to her knees. Oh, dear God, not my poor Robbie, she muttered, trembling. Mom, get the car, Tom shouted. She trembled in shock. Mom, come on, it's just a BB, not a real gun. Get the car, Tom shouted to his mother. Tom went in the car with his mother and Robbie to the doctor's office. The rest of us waited at the fort until they returned. It was only about an hour later that they came back. Rob had three stitches. He was going to be okay. We all knew, uh, we all knew he would be, but that must have been terrifying for Mrs. Larch. We had figured that we would all be in big trouble. Dr. Law had told Mrs. Larch that the children were to get rid of the BB guns, <clears throat> the uh, children were to get rid of the BB guns, but nothing came of it. We didn't get rid of them. Perhaps she said, perhaps we said we would, but there was no follow up. In fact, Mrs. Larch never once called my parents in all the years I knew the Larches. My mother never learned about the BB gun fights. Anyway, in another battle, I shot Daryl McBain in the face. He was prone in tall grass about a hundred feet away, shooting at me. We had exchanged a few shots, but e uh, shots each, but had missed uh, until I hit him. Uh, it was a small target trying to get his shoulder, and I hit him right in the face. He got up and rolled over in panic, shouting, Oh, God! You know, had I hit him in the eye? I regretted ever being there and hoped it was not his eye. I shouted for everyone, everybody to stop and ran to check on Daryl. He calmed down. He kneeled in the grass, holding his face downward, goggles still on. He slowly moved his head in a circle. We could hear the BB rolling around inside the goggles. It had hit on the side of his nose, just to where the goggle frame meets the skin, and had gone inside the goggle but missed his eye by half an inch. Daryl didn't say anything for a few seconds. He just moved his head to keep the BB rolling around in the rim of the goggles like a roulette ball. 
Then he said calmly, What are the odds? And chuckled. He wasn't angry at me. He certainly deserved it to be. That was the last BB gun fight I, per I participated in. When we were in seventh grade, we all saved our lunch money for a week to buy a car. Tom's older brother, Tony, worked at a garage. He told us that there was a Ford LTD station wagon at the shop that still ran but wasn't going to pass inspection. It was too old to fix, and it would cost $25 to have it junked. If we paid Tony $25, we could have the car. That, so that's what we did. Five of us saved up for a week. And that Saturday, Tony delivered the car to, to the field behind the Larch's house. It still did run. We all took turns learning how everything worked, learning how to drive. After a week or so, all of us knew which was the gas pedal and which was the brake. Tony told us to use only one foot to avoid hitting the gas and the brake at the same time. We practiced driving around in the field, which had once been a pasture. It was a great thrill to have our friends packed in the old station wagon while we each took turns driving, learning how to do rooster tails and donuts in the sandy part of the field. We were 13 years old. More than once, when we would be camping out at the fort, Tom or Robbie would sneak into the barn and take the license plates off their parents' car and put them on our car, and we'd go driving on the roads. One time, we really chanced it. We drove into New Dartford at night, parked on a side street, and went into the New Dartford and went to the New Dartford House of Pizza, and had a pizza. In all of those adventures, we never once got stopped by the police. Some of those guys liked stealing signs. They hung them on the walls of the fort as trophies. But when we were sophomores in high school, the police raided the fort and found the signs, the combined value of which added up to $3,000. We all had to go to court. After that, my parents forbade me to associate with those guys, but it was okay. I had noticed that I was having less and less in common with those guys as we got older. Our musical tastes had diverged. I could not discuss the meaning of song lyrics that I loved with them. I remember once in the fort, 16 years old, I was talking about the Bob Dylan song, Mr. Tambourine Man. Our music teacher in school, Mr. Nielsen, had played that song in class and had asked us what we thought of it. He had written part of the fourth verse on the blackboard. Take me disappearing through the smoke rings of my mind, down the foggy ruins of time, out past the frozen leaves, the haunted frightened trees, out to the windy beach, far past the twisted reach of crazy sorrow. I had written that in my notebook. In the fort, after school, I recited that to Tom, Robbie, and several of the guys. I thought that was brilliant. I couldn't define what it meant, but I really loved it. They, all, they had all looked at me like I had babbled nonsense in Greek. <laughs> Bullshit! Newt Nugent! Wang dang! Sweet poon tang! That's what a good song sounds like, Billy, Billy, uh, Billy Crow said. I was alone in my admiration for uh, admiration for Bob Dylan with that crew. I had known Rich Sanderson and Pete Mom since elementary school too, but I did not become friends with them until high school. They had always gotten good grades in school, and so uh, so had elevated to a different stratum from me and my crew. By the time we were all in high school, camping out high school, camping out at the party spots around New Dartford was the typical weekend activity for most of the kids in the area. This was before, before we got our driver's licenses. We would load up our bicycles with camping equipment and ride out on Fridays after school. Sometimes our parents let us camp out both Friday and Saturday nights. We would return bedraggled on Sunday afternoons. It wasn't camping in the wholesome sense. It was partying all night, P 
puking, then crashing in a sleeping bag. Once we, the fort crew, had set up camp on a great moss-covered moss -covered bluff overlooking the center of New Dartford. We called this spot the Moss. It had a sweeping view of the area, yet was difficult to see from the road. We never had our gatherings there interrupted by the police. This particular night, I had some weed and a little brass water pipe, sort of like a miniature hookah. We also had beer and liquor. Sometime after dark, we heard people approaching through the woods. We were careful, careful to keep our things, and that we were careful to keep things hidden in the woods in case the police ever did show up. We were quiet. If it was the cops, it was too late to douse the fire. We would just have to act like we were in innocently camping. Then we could hear their voices. I recognized Rich Sanderson. It wasn't the cops. I walked down to the edge of the woods. It was indeed Rich Sanderson and one other guy whose name I forget. They had planned on camping at the moss, but said they'd go somewhere else if we didn't want them there. We invited them to join us. They did. I shared the little hookah, and we all drank beers. Rich and I ended up talking for hours. It was that night that I realized that I had much more in common with Rich than I did with the fort crew. That must have been the summer after my freshman year at New Dartford High. Uh, I had begun my school high school career at Bishop Girton, uh, the, uh, the, boy, uh, the boys only Catholic school in Nashua where all of my brothers had gone. But I didn't do well there. I failed all of my classes. So at the end of the semester, I transferred to New Dartford High, the public school. It was good to be back with my friends. Actually, it wasn't quite as simple as that. It's true, I was failing all of my classes at Girton. There were a few of my friends from New Dartford whose parents had also sent them to Bishop Girton. In the mornings after we got dropped off before school, a bunch of, a bunch of kids would all gather at the far end of the parking lot and get high. It got to be that there would be about 20 or 30 guys out there hanging around, most of them smoking cigarettes, but usually somebody would have some weed. One day, just before final exams, I was in Sister Prig's Christian Values class. I forget her real name, but that's what we called her because she had told us that when she was young, she'd been in a chorus that performed on the Ed Sullivan Show the same episode as the Rolling Stones. She had mentioned it in previous yearbooks, too, uh, which I had seen because of my brothers. Underneath the, her picture, the caption said that when asked what she thought of the Rolling Stones, she'd said, Ick! So, we called her Sister Prig. Anyway, that was third period, as I remember. At the beginning of class, the principal, Brother John, called over the intercom, asking if Fran Tenney was in class. He was. Could you please send him to my office, Brother John said. Fran was one of the regulars at the fort. He'd moved to New, Dar New Dartford just a year or two before and had become one of our crew. I thought nothing about it. The class went as normal. Then, with about 10 minutes left of class, Fran returned. He had to go out of his way to walk by my desk on the way to his desk, and as he passed, he discreetly dropped a tiny note on my desk which read, Don't tell them there was weed, just cigarettes. There we go. Okay. About five seconds after that, Brother John called again on the intercom, this time for me. I went down to the office, not knowing what to expect but I didn't have any weed on me, and I sure as hell wasn't going to rat on my friends. I would stick to the story, just cigarettes. I had plenty of experience with getting sent uh, to the office back in junior high, but when I neared the office this time, I could see through the half-open Venetian blind that somebody else was in the room, sitting back to the window. A jolt shot through me when I realized it was my mother. That's a curveball, I thought. I entered the room to see my mother crying. Brother John sat smug behind his 
wood, big wooden desk. He told me to sit. My mother was sobbing. Whoa, my blood boiled. He knew my mother was on dialysis. He listed about ten names off a notepad, ending with me, saying that we had all been smoking marijuana out at the edge of the parking lot. I told him he was mistaken. It was cigarettes. Sorry, Mom, I smoke, I said. Her sobbing swelled. He said he'd seen us with binoculars, with his own eyes. He said that the others had admitted it. I held to my story, every syllable of which made my mother tremble. I never did back down. Looking back on it now, it must have been blood curdling for my mother. I'm sure she knew I was lying, and I never did back down. Right from that moment, I was out of Bishop Girton. I was to go home with my mother, who had to drive because I didn't have my license yet. As my mother and I were leaving the office, Bob, uh, Bob Erickson, also a friend from the fort, was being led out, uh, out of Brother Joseph, the vice principal's office. I was, uh, I, was silent and so I was silent and sullen along with my mother, but Bob exploded. This is a bunch of fucking bullshit. I've had it up to here with this goddamn place. I would never have acted like that in front of my mother. My mother winced at those shouted words. My mother knew Bob's parents from, from church. So that was the end of that. I had failed all of my classes and would be deemed unsuitable for Bishop Girton. But Brother John had prescribed punishment for me before I was officially gone of cleaning up the locker rooms on the weekend. It was after doing that that he informed my parents that I would not be coming back. My mother was devastated. After Francis, Matthew, Patrick, and all, uh, uh, Patrick had all graduated and Philip, a senior, was getting excellent grades, I had really let her down. New Dartford High was much better for me. They had an art program and they had girls. Can you imagine? Bob Erickson Fran Tenney, uh, and Fran Tenney had also transferred. Mark Perry, Chet Burns, you know, Mark Perry and Chet Burns stayed at Bishop Girton, Girton and eventually graduated. They'd, gotten, they'd always gotten good grades. I knew nobody had snitched. New Darford High was a breath of fresh air. My first morning there, when I got off the school bus, Tom Larch told me to follow him to the bathroom before school started. As we walked in, there was a guy watching the doorway, doorway from inside in case a teacher came in. We walked in, Tom ahead of me. Cool, cool, the door watchman said. Inside, there were about 15 guys, like a fort crew welcoming committee for me. Guys were smoking cigarettes and somebody passed me a joint. Tom explained that the rules were that if a teacher came in, the guy at the door, uh, the guy on door duty would shout, uncool, and then you drop whatever you're holding. If it's on the floor, they can't pin it on you. They had to see it in your hand or see you exhaling smoke. In the four years I would spend at New Dartford High, I never got caught doing anything. In some ways, school was actually fun there. It was spring semester of my sophomore year the, a year after I had transferred to New Dartford High that I met Chuck Lombardi. He and I went to our first Grateful Dead concert that May, and from then on, Chuck, Rich, Pete, and I became our own crew. I could certainly discuss Bob Dylan lyrics, lyrics with them. So it was in the beginning, high school. We remain friends to this day. Me, 57, living in Japan, Pete in Montreal, Rich in Vermont, Chuck in Boston. Okay. Just a second here. Okay, I'm going to call it a, I'm going to stop here. This is, we're on page 19, the top of page 19. So I'm going to stop here because it's getting pretty long. And I'll continue that chapter in a different, another video.